Um, Josh and I actually met at Town and Country um, when we were working our first job together at the grocery store. You know, he was 14 and I was 15, and that's how we just kind of met for the very first time was, you know, working together. We had been working together that entire time, going to high school together and everything, and we actually didn't start dating until about, um, it was 2006 when we started dating, so I was already, you know, in college, and he was finishing up his senior year, and we dated off and on, you know, until 2008, and then... You know, actually, 12 years ago today, he proposed. So, pretty, pretty cool story. I mean, we just got to grow up and learn about each other being friends, you know, before we even um, really started dating or, or anything. And so it was nice. His personality was uh, pretty reserved around most people. When he would be with a group of friends, like, a close-knit group. Uh, he was a little bit more outgoing um, just with his personality. You know, he'd goof off a little bit more and things, but um, he, you know, typically just kept to himself and very hardworking and um, definitely loved working on the cars and going to Gateway to, you know, drag race cars and eventually motorcycles and stuff too. It's a big hobby of his, him and Uncle Jeff. Um, his Uncle Jeff always um, were working on cars his whole life growing up and stuff. Josh actually grew up with his mom and dad um, taking him to church at a very young age and things. His dad um, was a pastor, actually, and his dad had passed away when he was six years old. So there, that faith life for him was very short-lived at a very young age and then was kind of set aside on the back burner. I believe through a lot of grief, you know, it's hard to continue certain things and so in 2006, when we started dating, he would come along to church every so often and, you know, he at Temple Baptist and we would do the whole Sunday school, small group, you know, church together kind of thing. And I felt like it just took a while to get there for him. You know, he had to familiarize it himself with that part of his life again. He came to know the Lord actually in March 2008, so it was very shortly before he had proposed to me. And I fully believe that he had came to that decision on his own because there was a lot of growth from 2006 in his faith to 2008. Josh always wanted and had an interest in the military um, from the get-go. His younger brother Aaron joined the Army, you know, at um, a very young age, and he, he had always kind of had that, I guess, in the background of his mind. But um, he was in a position where, you know, he was doing car sales um, for a local spot in town, and he ended up losing his job, and this was shortly after we got married. So, um, you know, he thought about it a lot, prayed about it, and he was like, I just really feel like this is the time that I need to take that step. And he did decide with the Air Force over the Army, you know, he just was hopeful that there were more opportunities there for continuing his education and um, being able to actually accomplish that and make it happen while working. Um, so. That was just kind of the path he took. He looked at, you know, a loss as an opportunity for something new to begin. 
military life was a big blur. <laughs> um, it was awesome. There were so many new traditions and things that we, you know, got to learn about when we moved to Georgia and um, we were on our own. Um, so two quiet, shy people having to branch out and make friends and, you know, gain relationships out of all of that um, big growth period for us. But um, deployments and everything, they were just, you know, a blur. We were fortunate that he was only having to deploy two and a half months at a time. I know so many people that that is not the norm, that it's such a longer span of time that they have to be away. Um, I was very grateful. In, in total, Josh did seven deployments. So, you know, there was a lot of give and take that had to happen. And, and all of that is just growing pains of, he's gone in one minute, dad's in the house and he's the one telling you, no, you can't do that. And then you have to switch gears and now it's mom saying no all the time. And dad comes back and uh, I feel guilty as the wife. I want them to have those special kind memories and interactions with each other. So it was uh, a little hard to, you know, let Josh take that lead when he came back because I was like, let me be the bad guy. You know, um, you can be the fun dad and I'll just be the mean mom. But um, it was definitely a challenge from time to time. For Josh, losing his dad made him completely take his fatherly role seriously with the kids. I think him being a father, that was the most important thing for him, you know. Everything for Josh was 150%. There was no 110, there was no, you know, 95. Even on his worst day, he was, you know, number one, <laughs> like everything he did. With his military career, that totally was just a driving force with him. He didn't have to have the top job in the Air Force, but whatever God had handed him, he was going to do it at its best. And he didn't just want to succeed for himself. It was, I'm going to help these guys do well on their PE or PT test. I'm, I'm going to work with them after work. I'm going to work with them on the weekend. We're going to go for a run. And you know, they're his buddies, those guys he was really, really close with, and he just wanted everybody to succeed. He wanted the whole squadron to do really well. So Josh's seventh deployment was actually to Okinawa, Japan, and he was at Kadena Air Base there. He left um, around September 24th, I feel like. It was right after we had celebrated our sixth anniversary. Um, so it was a long flight, and I was unprepared for the lack of communication at the beginning. Um, you know, anything new, you get used to the way it runs on deployments with the desert. We got a, a vibe going of how, what to expect and what not to expect. So this was new. Um, it was stressful definitely going into it because he wasn't able to call as often. Um, he was getting kind of settled in, you know, to things and um, the wife, the Wi-Fi was kind of spotty in places, so he'd have to walk pretty far just to make a phone call, you know. Um, it's, it's crazy to think that, but. Um. This morning, a powerful typhoon that washed three American airmen out to sea slammed into central Japan. Search crews are looking for two of the missing Americans. They were overpowered by waves on the island of Okinawa Sunday when airman was found dead. The storm came ashore with 90 miles an hour winds and driving rain. Millions faced the threat of flooding and mudslides. More than 600 flights at the Tokyo airport are canceled. What was October 5th here um, in the United States was the day that I woke up and was getting the kids ready for church. It was one of those days. He said the night before that he would call me in the morning. 
and you know before church and I was waiting for it you know okay is he gonna call is he gonna call well nope we gotta get on and move on and get to church um, I had no more than gotten to church then my friend had called me back to the nursery to get the kids and um, he then um, she said that we needed to go back, drop the kids off with her husband. Um, I, at this point, was honestly optimistic, I suppose, um, thinking that somebody had just gotten in trouble. I, my mind was not where everybody else's mind was. I was that was not on my radar at all. Um, long story short was we grabbed the kids, took them back to stay with someone, and waited around basically for the military to show up on my doorstep. Um, I, that's a very hard thing to, to, I'm thinking about literally every possibility other than what everyone around me is is thinking and um, so luckily at that point church had ended and my pastor was able to come over and I had one of my best friends there with me and they had knocked on the door just like you would see in the movies um, they came in and they read me off of a piece of paper you know that he was missing very early on October 7th, very early in the morning, I received a call. Um, like, we are coming by to see you. We, need, we just want you to be aware and be up and things. And so again, it was early morning, full house full of people. All of his relatives, my relatives, gathered in the living room. My kids are still not with me at this point. And again, they knock on the door and they come in. And that's when I get the news that he has been found and he is no longer with us. He has passed away. Um, Are you present? Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> You guys need to give daddy big hugs and kisses and tell him thank you. Thanks for my present. What else is in there? <laughs> a bag. Daddy! Can daddy open it? That's Can nice. I have a hug and kiss? Dad, what does that shark thing do? Dad, I want to help you open it. Sit down, Tammy. worst part was my kids coming back to me that afternoon and having to sit in my daughter's room that my husband had put every piece of furniture in there together and I'm telling my two kids dad's not coming home from that deployment their level of understanding was minimal my greatest happiest memory through all of that and it's odd to find a happy memory in the middle of it, is my daughter, my daughter saying, okay, mommy, I understand, running out the door to all of the children of my friends who are there, my niece, everybody, they're outside playing. 
and saying, my daddy's in heaven now, he's with Jesus. Brightest moment in all of that darkness. Um, still to this day, I tell her that story and um, just how special that was to each person that was in the room for them to witness a child maybe not understanding this, the severity of what was going on, but understanding the big picture. So. Sorry. That whole experience of losing someone is such a traumatic event. Um, it doesn't truly matter how it happens. Your life has changed in a major way. Um, I was 27 years old. I had every intention on spending the rest of my life with that man. We constantly would joke about growing old and sitting on the porch and not being able to hear each other in our rocking chairs. Um, but it is such a traumatic event to have that kind of loss in your life and to suddenly be left with two toddlers and to have your own personal struggles that you have to get through your own challenges and your own responsibilities, not to mention you've got two kids who look exactly like him and um, don't understand. At, that, at those ages, they didn't. They didn't understand at all. To them, it was like he's just gone on a really big deployment. For the longest time, that was a big challenge um, and having to kind of pour salt in that wound every time that I would have to explain, you know, well, death is different than a deployment. The day of the event of Josh's passing was um, the day that they were out hiking and they had found some waterfalls, you know, before. And he would always take pictures of little things that were um, relatable to the kids and I. And like he sent Kaylee a pink flower one day because he knew she would love it. So um, he had actually found a rock in the shape of a heart and he held it in his hand and he took a picture of it and he had his God's Not Dead bracelet um, in, in the picture too and it was it was just a massive rock and he held it in his hand took a picture of it and I knew that once his phone was, was recovered and I found that on there I was like he was going to send that to me as soon as he you know, got home. So that was just like a huge after comfort that came with finding all that. So my faith has definitely sustained me through this entire process. Um, it has been such a tremendous amount of growth and I have so far to go still, but um, I mean, I have spent multiple hours probably days at this point um, in prayer just crying out to the Lord I have been at my lowest of lows and I have poured my heart out to the Lord and there were times where it would be easy to blame God for everything but I found the determination in my heart and I would pray and even at my maddest or my most sorrowful moments, I would say, I refuse to blame you for this. This, like, I need you. I, you, I know I'm not lost in your eyes. Like, I'm here because you've seen me through this and I will continue to move, to move forward because you're a presence in my life. I know that.
First and foremost, what I would want the kids to know is their faith that their dad had in the Lord. Um, I, it takes a strong person to disregard their safety and to go where they're led by the Lord. And I don't doubt for a moment that when Josh was in Japan that he didn't hesitate for a second to jump in and do the right thing. He wasn't letting anything that God, but God lead him in that choice. Um, and it's all because of sin that death is in the world. It is not some thing that God, you know, needed me to go through or Kaylee and Cam to go through in order to grow stronger. This is a separate thing. Um, and I would say that it's easy when someone has passed away to like put them on a pedestal. But Josh was pretty much as close as you could get to that pedestal. Um, I feel like um, he was such a great person. I want him them to know of his work ethic and his determination to do great things and how much he loved them. And I never tell them enough. I constantly say it over and over, you know, your dad loved you so much. And each of these people, whether they knew your dad before or not, you know, it, the, it's such a blessing to be around those people and walk with those people that have seen him and heard his laugh and see that determination firsthand. Or, um, you know, even those who get to hear his story, you know, the story isn't about Josh and it's not about me, it's about the Lord.